All right, good morning, church. Welcome to those worshiping with us online. Hello to those out on the patio enjoying just a beautiful late summer morning. I'm so fired up. We got such an amazing guest speaker this morning. And just a little bit of background on a, a guy named Hugh Halter. He is a pastor. He's a church planner. He's the president of a leadership network that resources pastors and churches around the country. He's actually been doing a lot of speaking in this last season, so we're lucky to get him here this weekend. Uh, but maybe one of the most interesting ways to introduce Hugh this morning is that he is a Midwest farmer now. Would you believe it? A Midwest farmer. You'll hear more about that later. But most importantly, he is a friend to CPC. Amen? He is a friend to CPC. And let me explain that relationship. About eight years ago, I met Hugh when he spoke at something down in San Jose. And I just walked up to him afterward and I said, hey, do you do men's conferences, like men's retreats? Do you speak at those? He's like, well, sure. And we built a friendship. He came out to, and he spoke at two men's retreats for us. And then uh, every once in a while, he would come back, and then we sang a song earlier today. We sing it. It's one of our favorites here called Graves into Gardens. Do you guys love that song, Graves into Gardens? And that line right there, you turn graves into gardens, is about God being a redeemer. Like, God is a redeemer. And one of the ways that over the last couple years in this COVID season, this pandemic, when we were sheltering in place, we're going, man, how do we get people connected? Like, and especially... Dudes, like men, love to, it's hard to get them connected in the first place, but then when you go through a season where you give them license to hole up in their homes and not connect with other men, they really take advantage of that, and we retreat back into corners, many of us. So we go, how do we get guys connected and stay connected in our church? Well, we moved everything online, and we asked Hugh, Hugh, would you be willing to teach our men uh, one little 15-minute message a week from your, from your home? in Alton, Illinois, and we're going to post them on our YouTube channel, and we're going to do our work of gathering guys in these Zoom groups, and would you believe the redeeming power of God over the last year, we had more men connected in groups listening to Hugh's teaching between two and 300 men a week than in the history of men's fraternity. So can you just give God a round of applause for how he... And... I'll just tell you, these were not like, no, oh, I shouldn't even say that. I was about to say they were not like amazing videos. And I just mean the, <laughs> the teaching was amazing, but the production, like it was on an, Hugh on an iPhone, glasses across the bridge of his nose, like they're going to be a little bit later when he's teaching, and we were just loving what God was doing through him. And by the way, men uh, and ladies, our, our, our program, our our Fall programs start this week. We've got women's ministries and men's ministries. Men's fraternity starts live this Wednesday in this room at 6 a.m. And Hugh's going to be there and I'm going to be there, so you are invited to join us. But now, teaching God's word to us, a warm CPC welcome to Hugh Halter. Yeah, you can come right up here. You can go over there. Thank you. Good morning. Probably shouldn't pat you on the backside in front of the whole video that's watching right now. Sorry about that. Little thing between Tyler and me. Hey, good morning. morning. It's just nice to see you. I missed you guys. Missed you. Love coming back here. I was, uh, cue the first slide. How many of you watched Saturday Night Live last night? Yeah, that's what I thought, because it's no good anymore. (laughs) How many of you grew up watching Saturday Night Live? Okay, you remember... We would show up at the bus stop and we would go over all of, remember those days, guys? You'd go over, because it was good back then. It was real comedy. And if you remember, they had a thing called the Five Timer Club. Five Timer Club was for incredible, fantastic hosts uh, who they would just go, look, they're just so good that we got to keep having them back. And so they would get them this uh, smoking jacket right here. Well, last week, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, preaching at a buddy's church, and they presented me with my own (laughs) five-timer smoker jacket, and I wanted to show you because I've spoken at a lot of churches. They generally have never asked me back. I'm like one and done. (laughs) But you guys and this church in Knoxville, for whatever reason, you just keep having me back. 
So I'm just going to wear this. No, I won't. I look weird. People, people coming in halfway through the talk going, what's he wearing a Hugh Hefner classic smoking jacket for? If you just, anyway, well, it is good to always come back around. I think uh, last time I was here, I was talking about kind of moving through uh, pain and struggle. I told you a little bit about uh, our son's passing away this last year. Just kind of want to kind of keep the conversation going with you. Um, I'm learning as I get older, just turned 55, which feels super old to me. Remember when people were 55 back when you were younger? Like that was almost, that was dead. <laughs> and I just turned 55 and uh, I'm starting to relax a little bit about life and about what this whole thing is following Jesus. And I've learned that there's an incredible privilege to just sort of connect and be in each other's lives. Like, we, you know, some of you here, you were not a part of the CPC story one year ago or 10 years ago. Some of you have been here for uh, maybe 40, 50. I mean, who knows how long, but you've had a privilege of walking and sharing and connecting. And really, life is kind of passing through each other's lives. And sometimes we hold each other's faith for a week or two. Sometimes things happen and you lose your faith and you find that there's these people that you walk with and they kind of keep you going for the week, right? And um, it's, been a, it's been really a, a cool thing to have you guys pass through my life. Um, much of what we have done has been related to our son's struggle all of his life. Um, our move to Alton, Illinois was uh, centered around a conversation Tyler and I had when we were considering it. And I remember uh, Tyler showing concern and actually praying for our decision. So there's a lot of reasons why it's a privilege to keep connecting with you. And those of you that are watching, you're still in your jammies. Uh, it's just like, I love this church. I love the story of what you guys have been in this valley. I love your leadership. Uh, I love the humble posture. It's actually really good to see faces finally. Last time Tyler made me do this on a video, which is terrible, but it's just good to see faces this morning, especially when we are going through some really unprecedented, uncertain times. Um, We've got to begin to learn how to think through what it feels like to be in exile. And we're going to talk a little bit about this morning. But there's, if you've ever heard a word called a zeitgeist, a zeitgeist is a, it's a uh, thought of the times, if you will. It's an undercurrent or an unconscious uh, sort of psychology that we all share when you go through struggle like we all have and um, a couple of the zeitgeists of our moment are, uh, I was just reading an article about what's unique to now versus what was uh, maybe life three, four years ago, like completely different mindset about what many of us are going through. And one of them is just, uh, it's mentioned radical individualism, uh, that there is a sense that, in fact, that's why the real estate market is going berserk, even in really struggling towns like uh, where I live is that people are going, look, I'm, I'm just not going to go out anymore. They're not going to the health clubs. They're going to get their little Peloton. They're going to buy a little bit bigger house. They're just going to like circle the wagons and just kind of not go out anymore. It's radical individual. But also what we call hyper-consumerism, where people begin to look at life and they, they go, I'm only going to do what I absolutely have to to just get what I need. I can't control all the rest of this mess. And so I'm just going to do us and the kids and I'm not really going to sacrifice much anymore. I'm just going to get what we need, and maybe God will figure out the rest. There's also a zeitgeist that we would call a radical distrust of anybody in any form of leadership. <laughs> That's good news, right? Uh, we, we've lost, we literally have lost, uh, and I would admit I'm, I'm there too. You lose your sense of hope that any actual human being, politically oriented or otherwise, can actually land the plane. You know, and when, when you begin to distrust anybody in leadership, uh, and it happens a lot inside churches now, uh, we just, anybody in leadership, look, they can't fix it. And so we just sort of stop. When, when you're radically individualistic or radically consumerized, uh, you just stop moving. When, uh, when you feel like you can't trust anybody, you stop moving forward. You stop working together. Uh, there's a social weariness where we're tired of fighting with everybody. Maybe some of you have finally stopped finally posting some stuff on Facebook because you got kicked in the face so many times. You're just kind of getting weary of the battle even with the in-laws or friends that you thought always held your beliefs and you realize, oh, actually I have less friends than I, there's a weariness to that. There's a, a massive zeitgeist related to the economy and a growing 
gap between the ones that have some resource and the ones that have nothing. I'm from Portland, Oregon. I was back there a few weeks ago, and it is not the same town. It looks like I was off in exile and came back. It's like a bombed out city with hundreds of thousands of families now living in tents, lining freeways. It's the same thing up in Seattle a few weeks ago. It's literally this massive economic gap, which again causes us to go, well, if I got some, I'm going to try to hang on. I'm not going to go to that other side. And then the final one I just wrote down, there were many, but one is a, uh, a work ethic that, um, that says we don't really need to work. I've had it hard enough. My people have had it hard enough, so I'm just going to take whatever I can get for free. And so uh, the reason why many of us, um, those of you that are in construction, why things are so expensive right now is because we can't literally get people to work in factories or to drive trucks to get stuff to us. You put all that together, and it's happy news, isn't it? <laughs> so good start, Halter. You got us really fired up right now. But there's an uncertainty to it. We look around, we see little cracks and crevices in our world, even here in Danville. Or we might begin in certain cities, we begin to see rubble. We start to see entire societies beginning to crumble. We just have no sense of anything. It's just uncertain. And, and the psychological effect that uncertainty has on us is that oftentimes we get apathetic, we get cynical, we get judgmental, um, we get fearful. And then we literally punt on, not the fourth down, but we, bunt, we punt on the third down. We're just like, I'm out. The problem is, is that this beautiful thing called the church is not an individualistic, consumeristic, fearful anything. We are an advancing people. We're a counterculture people. We, uh, we might enjoy a good season of life, but when life gets bad, uh, according to the book, we're not supposed to fold up the lawn chairs and circle the wagons, that there's something about uh, our collective movement and we need to hear this morning, I was really praying for you, not just for a message for you, but I feel like I've needed a word from God. I don't know if any of you would, I know you're Presbyterian, I know, how, how many of you would just go, like, I'd be just desperate to hear from God right now. I was praying that no matter what, I would sort of move behind the scenes for you this morning. You would not remember anything that I say, but something would be said for each one of us today. Whether or not you're here or you're at home, we're just, um, we need to hear from God. And God's given us his book, his big word, and it's a prophetic word. You know, two-thirds of it are what we call prophetic. <laughs> it's God speaking to his people. But sometimes you don't feel like you're part of the big people. You need like a private word. Um, again, this will freak you out a little bit, but I got one the other day, a few weeks ago. I wanted to actually share it with you. I don't get a lot of these. I travel in, in rank and file of what I call non normal people, meat and potatoes, blocking, tackling. I don't oftentimes have people say, hey, I've got a, a thought I think is from God for you. But uh, I'm working with a young man that is an amazing young leader, and we've committed to create a network around the country and hopefully around the world that supports young leaders that go into the poorest of our cities and they begin to build out what we call kingdom ecosystems, business, economic, church, spiritual. And, uh, and since we declared that we would do that, he has taken so many hits. If you ever watch MMA, sometimes they'll put one big guy against two little guys in an actual ring and they'll, they'll, they'll actually fight. And if, if you watch the big guys, they always go after the other relatively big guy but the little guy will jump on their back and kind of punch him in the face 42 times. Eventually, the big guy will have to stop paying attention to the other big guy and take care of the little guy to get back to the big guy. And so this, this young leader that I'm with has been getting hit in the face with so many adverse things from past relationships, financially to you know what, that I've started to feel like he was losing his uh, vigor, if you will. And, an old friend of his, an old mentor, sent him a word. And he said this, so there's three people in the dream. There's the old fellow that's giving, that got the vision to the young man that I'm working with, and then he mentions some other older gentleman. He says, in the dream, I'm a general on a horse looking into the distance or future. You're standing with another man a bit older than you, and you say, where have you been? We've been looking all over for you. 
And this man said, even though I am on the horse, I am not the general. The general's name is the Lord is our banner. I am simply the message. And so I respond, I'm easy enough to find. Just look for me on the battlefield. I'll be the one out in front. And then you say to the young man, which way to the battlefield? And the older man on the horse says, you're both going in the right direction. Keep walking the way you're going. And when you hear the sound of cannon fire, run towards it. And then the dream ends. And the uh, old gentleman, obviously my young friend, thanked him for the encouragement. And the old guy said, so who is the older guy in my dream? And uh, have you been hanging out with an old guy? Why? I don't know why I keep mentioning the old guy. <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, I actually have been partnering with a guy named Hugh Halter. And uh, he, he said, I don't know him. Kind of like if I were to walk in your office, try to look for Hugh Halter books, I did not find any today. It would be like, uh, that's another thing we'll talk about. Um, but uh, my friend said, yeah, his name's Hugh Halter, and uh, I don't know him. So he sent him a photo of mine off Facebook, and the guy said, oh, yeah, that's the guy I saw in the dream. And I just remember feeling like, you know, I didn't have to be a key player in this. It's just nice to know that God has my face on his refrigerator still, you know? <laughs> that I get to be a, a, a character in a plot, even though I don't know what the plot is, but we need to hear from the Lord this morning about what it means to live as we're coming out of exile or as we live in exile. I'm gonna give you a quote by a good friend of mine in Australia, a guy named Alan Hirsch. He's one of our favorite missiologists of the, of the present time. He said, the church of Jesus needs to wake from the passivity that comes from exile and embrace the tension and adventure of the kingdom of God or continue as a religious ghetto for culturally co-opted folk. That makes sense? Like there's, there's a point where the passivity that we oftentimes feel where you just go, I'm just going to back it down for a while. I'm going to downshift and just neutral. Hope the world gets a little bit more uh, doable in three or four years. There's something that happens where we actually have to begin to hear from God again and realize the identity of what we are as God's people, and the identity of who you are as his son and as his daughter, and what our role in the world is. I'm going to take you to a passage out of Zechariah, which is one of the, the great prophetic books. It's short. That's why I love it. Um, and there's, there's two prophets. There's an old guy named Haggai, who's the old guy, and then there's young Zechariah. And Zechariah is beginning to share some assurances for his people. And, uh, and I'll just give you a little heads up. The first eight chapters, we don't have time to go through it. It's all these, if you've ever seen a Quentin Tarantino movie, it looks like that. It's these wild dreams and visions. And it's mostly a story of um, the prophets saying, look, we got in this jam and it's probably mostly our fault. There's always a sense of when we come through a difficult time, we have to stop and take a moment of, or maybe not a moment, but take a posture of repentance and recognize that the world goes the way it goes, oftentimes because we create a vacuum, that God's people are the ones that are to fill the vacuum. But when we take our hands off the wheel and we just go, hey, world, just good luck, is that we actually create even a bigger vacuum. It's often been said that the world, everybody's discipling somebody in the world right now. And if the church doesn't make disciples, the world surely will, agreed? And if we are not discipling our sons and daughters, the world will disciple our sons and daughters. If we just hands off and hope that it's going to get better, we have guaranteed our fate. And we have guaranteed the fate for many other people will not be what the Lord designed for his kingdom. So we have to hear. And so starting in chapter 9, he finally gets to a great assurance. I'm going to give you two assurances for us today. And I'm going to have us read this out of Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. You remember this when we do, uh, you know, just the week before Easter, right? We always share that story of Jesus coming into the world um, and he's riding on a donkey. This is fulfilled in Jesus. If you ever doubt whether or not the Jesus story is real. I hope some of you are in here today and you've not been into this story. Maybe you've not wanted to trust it. Maybe you've seen things happen inside the church or with Christians that was not interesting to you. Uh, but but if, when you try to hold on to faith that the story might be real, sometimes the prophetic stories that 
or the prophetic words that were mentioned six, seven hundred years before, then they all get fulfilled in this person called Jesus. Well, this is one of them that he, he comes riding into the world. Your first assurance is this, that your Messiah King is coming. Okay? Your Messiah King is coming, and so your work and your works in the world are going to matter. When we think about Jesus coming into the world, for most of us, if you grew up in a church environment, Jesus' personal coming in was what we call the incarnation. And when you ask people why did Jesus have to come into the earth, why did he have to come take bodily form, we almost always refer to him coming and dying on the cross for our sins, correct? And I've shared some of this with you before on, on other passes through, that the incarnation, the story of Jesus and the cross is actually not primary to Jesus. I know that sounds weird. Uh, great theologian Dallas Willard said that, that the cross is preliminary Okay? Jesus had to go to the cross to disarm the powers of evil and darkness in the world. He had to set us free from the law of sin and death. Right? He had to take upon his shoulders all of our sin and be the atoner, take the penalty of God for our sins to set us free. That was not primary. It was huge, but it was not primary. Preliminary. I'm going to have to do this for these people I love so that the good news of, if you remember, the good news of the kingdom of heaven, the messianic reign would now begin to take effect. And so Jesus' pathway into the world is not just to do an act once and for all way back 2,000 years ago for us. It was that he would begin to create, after he set us all free, he would begin to create a new humanity that would begin to live like he lived in the world and begin to establish his reign on earth as it is in where? This is why he taught us to pray. He's like trying to disciple the young humans and trying to help the world a little bit. He said, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? Right here today in Danville. That God was establishing, recreating the original design that the world would, would feel and taste and touch his shalom again. Is this making any sense? So the, the great assurance of Jesus coming the first time is that your work and your works matter. That when you go, it, it doesn't matter, Hugh. There's, it's too bad right now. There's no little thing I can do to actually affect change. That's, that's a zeitgeist of the day. It's not a kingdom. The kingdom zeitgeist is, oh, no, it matters. And it will bear witness to the world if they see you with a smile on your face leaning in and running towards some cannon fire every once in a while. And so as I've processed this last six years in Alton, Illinois, came in at 49. God gave us a building. Many of you remember that story. He gave us a building. We had no idea. All, all we knew was that my wife thought we could help the town. She said, why don't we move here, see what we can do. And so all of a sudden, a guy gives me a building right in the middle of downtown, um, and we just turned it into the, the living room for our city. About five different businesses, and it was a work. It was literally a work. It was 16 hours a day for 12 months, and then trying to figure out how to do businesses I had never done before. And it was a work. It was a beautiful work, but it was a work. A along the way, we renovated seven homes, two for each of my two daughters and their husbands and kids and uh, now we're on our third for Cheryl and I in six years. Uh, after our son passed, I, I don't know if I was able to, to finish the story, but Cheryl went into a pretty deep dive. And uh, as she began to came out, out of that, she realized that her next work would be to do an equine therapy scenario, begin to dive into some of the mental health issues, people that live in constant trauma. And so we acquired an 80 acre uh, farm, and now I have a tractor and all sorts of things, and it's a work. It's, it's, again, it's a beautiful work, but it's work to do. And amidst the work, I do some of the, those things for Cheryl. It's actually part of the kingdom to do good works for your spouse. And it's a good work to do things for your children. And so right now I'm building a, a toddler REI uh, zipline village because <laughs> uh, we have so many. Right now this is the center of our little church community, so everybody comes out to the farm. 
Uh, this next Sunday, I'll fly back. We'll have a nice little baptism service, sunrise service, and everybody will come out. It'll be all, all these toddlers. And I don't actually like toddlers. It's not... Uh, <laughs> And so I'm building them this huge, like, uh, mini day camp. They can, we can keep an eye on them out there. Nothing will fall more than three feet. It's trees and logs everywhere and all sorts of stuff. It, to me, it's a good work. And I think about the other people in our community. And we're, not a, we're just about a handful of little missionaries uh, trying to work together. And I think about the Piocas family. And they're busy. That's my daughter and son-in-law, but they took on uh, foster care, and they're now going to be adopting uh, Kobe and Diari. And they always feel like they can't really get at anything for the Lord. There's like, we just, and I go, guys, this is your work. This is a huge work to just adopt two children that have lived in severe trauma. I think about the McCall family that moved up from another city and they brought a homeless man named Milt that had become a part of their family. And uh, they just brought him up because he's literally just, they have five kids, he's number six. When they moved up, our community embraced and we got to be blessed by their whole work. And we uh, had another house donated for them. We put them on one of the worst streets in our city. And they just sit down on the porch and if you go to their house during any meal of the day, there's a handful of kids from the neighborhood. Most of them do not have mothers and fathers. And then there's Milt. And I just, I, I, I just go, what an amazing work that they're doing. Um, I asked a young uh, business owner right around the corner, I said, what do you hear about the McCall family? And he said, oh, they're just changing our neighborhood. I just think about that, just opening up the house, meals. When COVID hit, there was no kids in school. Lindsay just started a school upstairs for all the kids in the neighborhood and just... Beautiful, beautiful work. I think about a young family, the Gaithers, that um, didn't know what to do in our town, but people were freezing to death, so they helped start a warming center for folks that were literally going to die if we don't get them warm. And they also, there was a little woman right around the corner that um, she was a hoarder. She hoarded cats. And uh, there was some mental illness there, but they just began to love her. They just had no idea how to fix it, but they just began to love her and eventually got her into a place that could help her and have moved out about 600 of the, no, just a lot of cats. And (laughs) now they said, hey, what do you think about us? Actually, the house has been vacant now. It's another one of the blighted homes in in our city. They said, why don't we just try to buy that and renovate the house just as a symbolic gesture to just make it beautiful and actually smell good again. It was just an, a, a little work. Another uh, young man that started our coffee roastery, um, y- young guy named Marquise began to come in, homeless kid. Um, we didn't know what to do with him. There was some pretty severe mental illness there. And we just, we couldn't figure out how to manage him. And I just remember David just going, we're just going to take him. And so they just help Marquise. They shower him when they find him around the city. They let him into his house. But I just, all these are little works. And if you don't believe that the messianic kingdom is actually real, then why would you do any of this? this? None of this stuff works. But if the kingdom of God is alive and well, and if Jesus says, I want you to bear witness to the world that this thing is true, then this assurance of Jesus coming in and showing us what to do finally matters. He is our, the beginning of our new humanity, the firstborn over all creation. He comes into the world as light, and then he says, now you guys will be children of what? You're children of light. You just, I'm going to be the first one in, first one on the battlefield. Just come in and just keep her going. It said that Jesus, if you accounted and let us in on all the great works that he had done, it would fill volumes that would fill the earth, right? And then he said, and you guys will do greater works than me. Guys, it is the great assurance that Jesus the Messiah King is coming for the first time. And so your work in the world and your works in the world matter. And you just need to hear it. And I pray it will break you out of apathy. The second assurance is just simply this. Much shorter. Your Messiah King is coming again. And therefore you don't have to overwork. Someday when he comes again, it will be the final Messianic Kingdom in fullness. It will be global shalom. And all of the stuff that brings great pain to us to watch the world go through will literally happen no more. There will literally not be another tear that is shed. It's, it's about the sovereignty of God. And some of you need to hear a little bit, as we say, spur one another on 
towards love. Some of you needed to hear the first word. And you know it feels good to finally go, you're right, i got to get back in. But some of you need to hear that you need to chill out and stop trying to save the world. God's sovereignty is maybe one of the best things to, to realize every morning. You can do good works, but you can't do all the works. And there's a point where not only do we witness to the world by our works, but we also witness to the world by how we are able to relax and have some moments of levity and enjoyment. This uh, young man that started a coffee roastery, on the back of his, the bags of coffee, he wrote the vision for the coffee. I want to read it to you this morning. It's, he calls it idle coffee, I-D-L-E, like you're idling it says, Idle Coffee was born on a fragile, fragmented morning with a few close friends. This was at the McCall House, sitting out on the porch, actually, amidst the noise in our heads and the clamor of rushing motion right outside our door. We find our, ourselves huddled in a peaceful moment around warm coffee. It was then that we realized our favorite part of any destination isn't the journey, it's the pause. It's the pause to map and to plan and reflect and then get back on the journey again. We hope the contents of this bag bring you great moments of idol amidst whatever journey you're on. This is uh, today. I will leave after the second service, and I will have a moment of idol. I am going to go down to Whole Foods, and I'm going to buy a salmon and a sharp knife, and I'm going to sit on the hotel bed with some lemon and some ginger, and I'm going to carve off big slabs of salmon or eat it right off the bow and while I watch the tour championship without any of my grandkids around for five hours. I'm going to take a moment for Hugh Halter. I also got word that a friend of mine is giving me a one-day pass to the Ryder Cup up in Whistling Straits in a few weeks. I'm going to drive six hours by myself all the way up past Chicago and just have a day just by myself watching some incredible golf. That's the kingdom of God. I used to feel guilty about those days. I used to feel guilty anytime I would stop the work. And I'm starting to realize that it's as much a witness when I can enjoy a little time for me. And sometimes uh, that rest is to be more present with the people that you love. Uh, last week I was setting uh, posts on the farm with post hole diggers. I was working hard. I could hear all the grandkids come up. They all scream, all four of them. They just all scream. They get out of the car, and they're screaming. And I'm not good at screaming, so I just I keep working farther away. And, and, uh, and they all get in this four-wheeler, this quad. And they're going, Papa, Papa, come drive us. And I act like I don't hear them. <laughs> and they, I noticed that all four of them had that jumped in there, and they were all yelling, Papa. I could see my wife and my daughter sitting on the deck watching. They're trying to go, is Papa going to actually stop working? And so I got into the four-wheeler. And as they saw me come walking over, they just literally couldn't. They were peeing themselves. They couldn't <laughs> contain that I would stop working and Papa was going to ride in the four-wheeler with them. And we got in and we just started tooling around. And we were, <laughs> it was just kind of fun. I was saying I'll get back to it. And then I, I don't, what came over me, maybe the kingdom of God is I just punched it. And we started going up and down. You know, they were almost flying out. Limbs were flying out. I have these nets that I, I hook in around with bungee cords to keep them in. And they started laughing and screaming. And to their surprise, I started laughing and screaming. We were, I was trying to out-yell them. And we went flying by Cheryl and my daughter, Allie. And they were actually peeing themselves. They were... <laughs> Watching Papa have so much fun and to be present with the kids. And I just remember thinking about this great assurance is that God is coming back someday. And yes, our witness in the world is that we work hard. But we don't quit ever. We never quit. We go down swinging for this world. But also that we sit around with friends that we love and we laugh and we drink good drinks, and we have great food, and we have unique experiences, and the world can look at us as a movement. Maybe, maybe the word for us today is that we live between the two comings, right? The first coming and the second coming. And our posture within those two worlds is that we live hard 
and we work hard and we play hard. And if we would get back to that, guys, I will tell you this, is that the world thinks that Christians don't do anything to really help. And they also think that we're not really a good hang anymore. These are not the people you'd want to hang out with. And the word for CPC in the future and the church in America, when the whole world is freaking out, are to be people that, with a smile on their face, keep their hand to the plow, and then they can come off of it and just sit around and enjoy a morning together over some great coffee. So whatever you needed to hear this morning, some of you, some of you need to hear the Lord say, um, the cynicism and the judgment and the anger is only killing your own soul. Shalom is not going to come in. And you just need to have a walk with the Lord maybe today. And by faith, just say, I'm willing to work again for you. And some of you, this is my prayer for you, is that you will stop working so hard. And you will be present and that you will scream and laugh with the ones that are most important that you do that with. And may God's kingdom come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's stand and pray, and we'll be on our way here. Uh, Hugh, on behalf of our church, thank you for that word. We receive it. Thank you. Let me pray and ask uh, God, the Holy Spirit, to help us discern which one of those words we need to hear and put into practice in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the teaching of your word through a friend, Hugh, who we know loves you, Lord, and we know and we believe and we trust that he loves us. And that's why he gives us a word like that. Um, Sometimes not an easy word to give and sometimes not an easy word to receive. And so, Lord, for those of us who need to receive the first part of that word, to get back in the game, so to speak, to put our hand to the plow, to run toward a little bit of cannon fire, I pray that you would encourage us to do that, that you would also bring some conviction about the things that keep us from wanting to do that. Maybe it's too much news. Maybe it's too much uh, a political talk. But I don't know what it is. But, Lord, you do because you know us and you love us. And you want us to live out that kingdom work ethic for you on the heels and with the trust that that promise that the Messiah King has come and is coming back. And Lord, for those of us who quite frankly are are prone to overwork, believing that if we're not working all the time, that we are not doing what you've called us to do, Lord, help us to rest. Help us to enjoy a little bit of shalom. Help us to celebrate that uh, a respite, a day away, a weekend away, a meal with friends, taking our hand off the plow and being present with our kids, our spouse, our grandkids, our greatest friends is also a message to the world that we trust the work of our Father in heaven that he is sovereign and indeed in control. So God, convict us, move us in response to this message. We thank you for the power of your word. I pray your blessing and your protection over our church until we meet again. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.